Eric Ball. He's got a lot going on. Uh, all right, so um, if I get my focus into the blue blue book instead of the command line window and hit the right button, something might happen at some point. Well, I have to pick a presenter, don't I? It won't work right again. Okay, this is just kind of a quick history of uh, where we've been with BPS memory model. Uh, largely a journey of my understanding what people really needed from that memory model. Uh, and uh, thanks to Fred J's efforts with .cad.ml files uh, uh, last spring, we actually have an executable model uh, that handles all the current instruction set. And so what's new this time as far as that goes are a couple things. Uh, one is uh, that there's a Low required store release instruction that's been for focus to instruction set. Uh, the format and everything hasn't been set up, but we can still access the memory model and correct has done that. And uh, one of the things left over last time was validation. And so we're going to uh, uh, put the pack together a bit to, to take LTMS with this test, turn them be a test less than this test. And uh, so we ran through that and we'll talk about that a little bit too, given time. Okay. Um, what more could be needed? Um, this is how you get the model. Uh, the slides are uploaded. You can get them down there. But this is fairly easy to do. You, um, for the base model, you just use the main herd 7 repository. If you want the new stuff that isn't official yet, uh, talk to us and we'll give you current J's model uh, repository with special software. And then you follow instructions and then you just say herd 7 and give us packs to the list of steps you have and which has BPF assembly in it and there you are. Um, we've got a few test types prepackaged in a directory in the herd 7 main repository. And uh, I'm not going to go through them, but that's just the ones we have. Um, and uh, Fred added a hundred or so more based on the con ones I converted from the LTMN memory model uh, to test. Okay. So this is an example test. This is the same one we showed back in Salt Lake City a few months ago. And as you can see, you have a little thing saying it's BPS. There's an arbitrary name. You can have initialization of registers and of goals variable. And then you have two processes with vertical bars between them and BPS assembly language statements. And this thing does the moral equivalent of a full state space search through all the outcomes. And the exit plot at the bottom uh, gives the outcome you inter are interested in. In this case, we're curious whether we can have a, a process that winds up to be zero while still having the final value back to be two. Okay. And the tool doesn't really care if that's right or wrong. It just says, can this always sometimes or never happen? All right. But normally, the usual way people work is they make that be kind of like an, a life change you warn on. So this is usually the thing you don't want to happen. And you want to get as many responses as a result. And in this case, we do in fact get that never. It actually runs this as the output we get. And so that never says that uh, in this particular set of BPS instructions running concurrently, this particular outcome cannot happen according to the BPS instruction level memory model. Assuming that's accurate and you haven't done something like take your BPS assembly run it for a full uh, compiling and optimizing itself out of existence, for example. Okay. And so I'm going to hand it over to Ren Jay. He's going to talk about what's required to get a final release working. So since the last time it was presented in Salt Lake City, we have tried adding two new instructions, uh, not to BPS itself, but currently to the memory module. And uh, those two instructions are uh, load acquire and store release. And because these two instructions don't exist in the BPS spec or the JIT or any uh, related to BPS, we had to choose we had to choose the instruction formats ourselves. We chose this uh, C style format which is close to how other atomics and BPS also look like. So load acquire is basically make a function call and go release as well. And so we had to make two choices regarding these uh, release and release consistency operations. One is that we had to choose if we have to make it RCPC or RCSP. So the difference between, similar to the difference between the ARM64 and the 
APR and LTV in our instructions. So LD APR was re recently added in the 64V8.3 and this basically defines that two different uh, critical sections can overlap. So the earlier one which was LDAR, if this instruction appears after a store release instruction, it doesn't get reordered before that. But the LDAR instruction can get reordered before an earlier store release instruction. So this is the uh, weaker one of the two. And with, uh, with BPS we have chosen the weaker one which is RCPC. This is because uh, we can make a weaker memory model stronger by adding fences, but we can't make a stronger memory model weak because it's set in stone. And we want to, with PS, we want to support all the weaker memory models like PowerPC and now ARM64 with the DARP uh, DR instruction as well. So, and the other choice that we had to make was if we have to make the store release operation A cumulative. Uh, now this A cumulative property is an interesting one, so I have an example here to explain what it means. So here I have a litmus test kind of scenario where we have three CPUs which are doing something in parallel. So you would have to pay a little attention to understand what's happening here, but basically the first CPU is writing jump to a shared variable X and the CPU 2 reads that variable and then it's one to a variable y with the release uh, operation. So, read of x in CPU 1 will always be ordered before the release of uh, 1 into y. And then the third CPU is trying to read both of these variables. First, the y variable which was set in CPU 1 and then reading x. And uh, while reading y is using the acquire operation, so the second read will always be ordered after the first read. Now the question here is, will the second read in CPU2 uh, read 1 or 2? And this is something which most programmers assume while writing code, but this is not something uh, implicit. We have to explicitly define this in the memory model if this behavior occurs only. And the question is, can that set read a 0? Uh, what that means is the write which we did in CPU 0, is it reach both of the CPU 1 and CPU 2 together? And what a cumulativity means is if we say that the release in CPU 1 is a cumulative, then everything that CPU 1 read before this release will be visible to all the CPUs that acquire this variable and release a uh, read a 1. So that means R2 equal to 0 can never occur if we define this release operation as a cumulative. And this is what we have done because most architectures, or all architectures on Linux support this. Uh, so I could now show you a demo, but before that we have a slide showing you how much changes this took. So when this was presented in Salt Lake City, all the big support, uh, the parser and the lexer for assembly instructions of BPS was already merged in HERD, and adding two new instructions does not require a lot of changes now. So now I could show you a demo of the litmus test which I just discussed about a cumulativity. So, this is the same test which I just discussed where there are three CPUs and the first one is writing to a variable, the second one is reading it and writing to another variable with the release. Then the third CPU is uh, reading both of them, the first one requires one mix. And this is uh, using the two new instructions we, which we have just added. And in the exist clause, we are asking if it is possible to read a 1 in the first read in the CPU, the third CPU and then read a 0. And because we have defined the release to be a cumulative, it's hard to say never when we run this test. So, let me run
done this on the stick of paper or third time now. I think it's already here. You can see that it's just a keyboard starting with the same thing. So as you can see, uh, the key it has connected this of uh, of these keys, and then I can have uh, both of the RGB and Repository the cat file has been updated to. And I'm just saying, if any one of you wants to try this, you can clone the new branch and try out the same pocket thing. So I think now uh, Paul will discuss how he created a script to validate all this against the Linux development model. Thank you, Bernie. So what's the if I can make this work. There we go. And uh, one of the things that was uh, left over last time uh, was we hadn't done much in the way of validation and session by hand. And of course, one of the key things is we want this to be consistent with the Linux kernel memory model. We'd also like it to be consistent with hardware memory models to that end. That's something that we'll talk about a little bit as well. So one straightforward thing is we got a whole pile of OPMM Linux kernels of them in my GitHub Litmus repository. And, uh, you know, uh, you could run a script to do that. And uh, it's really kind of like something a little more formal. Because, I mean, um, off is not necessarily one's first choice for a uh, parse for them, especially for GIF. But the uh, thing is, is that the uh, Linux test is stylized enough that that actually is the fastest way to get it done at the moment. You don't have to worry about all the crazy things that could happen in an arbitrary program. Uh, but uh, I'm going to leave that to somebody else. If you really want to uh, take on the thing and get a real parser involved and really do it, you know, please, and I'd be happy to mark this thing off the list. But right now, one place to start is in the Linux kernel source tree. We have this cool memory model litmus test directory that has 35 litmus tests in them. And, uh, well, I wasn't gutsy enough to try to um, translate ArcView read log, let alone synchronize ArcView into DTF assembly language that would implement ArcView. Uh, nor was I for locking or ArcView, so I just excluded those steps. And then I am. Um, so that left 22. And then, uh, um, not necessarily going to be needed, but the first step, I didn't cover them. Uh, but it's important for control dependencies. Um, and the rest of the store and B, I just, uh, uh, there's only a few of them, I didn't worry about it. I got a 720, so we're potentially convertible to DTF. And all of those have compatible apps. All right. And uh, uh, I did find one bug in my script doing that, which is which is valuable. Um, and by the way, what a compatible app stuff. It's okay for an assembly language to produce a stronger result than LPMM specifies. All right. So, LPMM says, hey, yeah, this could sometimes happen, and the BTS assembly says, no, it can't ever happen. That's okay. I mean, give or take our desire to make sure that we can efficiently implement, efficiently just DTF instructions to all the architectures we care about. All right. So uh, basically, if they match, or, you know, if, 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 uh, the, uh, if, they, if they match, or if the LPMM says sometimes and BTS says never, those are all okay. The other one is the box I mentioned, and there's something like 5,300 limits tests there. And uh, if you get rid of RQ, SRQ locking and weak barriers, then a lot of them, uh, the whole point of this thing was when we were developing RQU support for LPMM, that was why this archive was created in the first place. And so it's not too surprising that the, in fact, that the majority of these things do in fact involve those things, but we're not going to do that for this. And then uh, we get rid of a couple hundred more by uh, getting rid of state statements and uh, SMP sort B. And then uh, uh, there are some restrictions. Uh, there are some things that you can do in a limit test that don't make a whole lot of sense in DTF, so we exclude those as well. We end up with 146. Of those, 133 um, didn't have ca uh, weird cast or unmarked accesses. So in other words, um, 
that now we insert the limits that they read once or write once, and we turn that into a BTS loader to go by. If we have a limit set to just loads, you know, but with a compiler, you know, A equals B C language statement, we say, look, we don't do data races for get, right? Um, and so we also include uh, a limit set to stop come if the calculation is deadlocked or any data races. Right? And after we get rid of all that, we get to 133 we can actually do something with. And uh, of those, 126 are incompatible outcomes, and seven are not. And this was a state as of uh, Tuesday afternoon, a few days ago. But uh, before Tuesday ended, Craig and Jay put this in. Um, and there, by the way, there were a lot of scripting bugs. I mean, this was, uh, there, this was a voyage of discovery for how to make that script actually work. But we did have a memory model bug. And uh, uh, this was pending, and now once we got that fixed in, uh, then we have no incompatible outcomes. So uh, one of the things I have on my list still is to make the models, at least the simple ones, with statements work. And, uh, well, maybe that will be right, or maybe I'll have some more bug reports. Her and Jay will come out of this. To be, de to be done. I want to talk a little bit about computation from JIP. Um, this is, uh, comes down to a slide that we had last time in Salt Lake City initially suggested that uh, the same restrictions apply to BTS assembly language as apply to C code in terms of having to protect your dependency. Right. I'm not going to go into detail on those, but there's a file in the Linux kernel source tree, rcdreference.rcp, in documentation rcu, that goes into great detail about what you have to do in C code to make sure that the compiler doesn't mess up your FF dependencies that RC re relies on. And there's another one, uh, documentation memory variator does that, that talks about what you have to do should you be tripping up the control dependencies in your Linux kernel C code. So initially I was saying, yeah, the BTS code has to do that same thing, but um, uh, in talking to people, that was in the end applied, right? Just assembly language after all. And so uh, Alexi suggested a change, which I made. Um, and uh, what we've got, the reason this is important is because we have this kind of source level. We compile it to BTS assembly, all right? And then we have a memory model we compare that against. So we have to have the BTS assembly we generate in accordance with the memory model of the language. So if we're coming from, say, Rust, and Rust does store, release, and load fire, the BTS assembly language would need to have, uh, well, excuse the instructions out of the store, release, and load fire. If it has a full memory barrier, then we have to have an instruction sequence that has a full memory barrier, so it's absolutely consistent. But there's another level of translation. BTS assembly, as far as I know, does not have a hardware real realization. Um, maybe it does by now, and I haven't told us about it. Who knows? But as a result, uh, you don't actually execute BTS instructions. You ship them to something else. And the ship just has to also pay attention to the memory model. Um, in this case, including the dependencies. There, was, there have been proposals for people taking the BTS assembly Pushing it through um, the entire stack of the ship. Um, and uh, yeah, it makes an entire compiler. Uh, and that's a noble experiment. And it would strongly suggest restricting yourself to a single thread of BTS for grants if you really want to do that. Um, and it might be better just to not do it at all. Uh, but let me put it this way Would you take x86 or excuse me, ARM V8 assembly code, turn it into C, run it through a full-up compiler, and expect something useful to happen. That's still a lot. All right. So please learn why not cut that. You know, that's just not something that's legitimate. You do not take ARM assembly language, turn it into C, if it's concurrent. Now, if it's a thread, okay, maybe that would work. I'll, but I'm, I'm not going to say anything about that. That's up to you. You, you break it, you buy it, right? But if you're taking a current ARM V8 assembly code and you're converting it to C code, running it through a compiler and expecting the x86 code to do something useful, I'm sorry. Um, you, you voided your ARM V8 memory model warranty by doing that because the compilers don't understand ARM V8 memory model. And the same thing is true here. You take BTS instructions, run them through a full-up compiler, you probably voided your 
or EPS memory model guarantees. But you have to be careful. And there's other reasons why you have to be careful. Um, register mismatches. Um, EPS is interested in having 11 registers. And I don't know if a hardware manufacturer has 11 registers. Um, what that means is that they have to be mapped. In, in my script, for example, I map global variables to the top down and, and local variables from the bottom up to make that work. Uh, if there are fewer registers, then you have to, the JIT has to pull and reload the actual machine registers to make sure that it can, can accommodate the 11 registers the EPS assembly thinks it has. If there are more registers, then it's tempting, and I think it happens, that you'd like to optimize to avoid those conflicts. I acknowledge this is something the JIT can do. Um, and so uh, what they tell me is that a lot of JITs treat those things as auto registers to make sure that's been taken. And keep the normal, uh, and the other one was just looking at me funny, so maybe I'm not saying the right thing, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, yes, have some conventions, it has ABI, and uh, so do all of the assembly uh, languages that you would object to, and those have to be paid attention to, so the JIT has to map the calling conventions. And uh, this is apparently a fun when you're a stack unwinding guy. Have nothing but respect for somebody who is unwinding a stack that goes through assembly, through C code, through a BPF helper, and back through C code again. I mean, I have fun with it. Um, I'm glad I'm not doing it. So, uh, another thing is inlining can cause trouble. Arithmetic operations, um, and this is something that is uh, of more concern. If you multiply something by zero, um, there's a lot of math in processing. We'll just say k dot zero, and this other computation doesn't matter. We have to worry about how to make pennies from that. And also, range based inference can mean that the JIT knows that a given register is unbounded. Um, and that also can, can cause problems with dependencies. So, yes, optimization can break dependencies. Um, and one way of dealing with this would be to have a tool that checks them. And there's some discussion on doing that with something called a tantalized key litmus. And the idea is you have a, an assembly language. Um, assembly language litmus test, and this thing converts to a kernel module. The kernel module will repeatedly execute the things. It's not quite as good as a full state space search, but it can give you a, it hammers on it pretty hard. And that's one way of detecting those sorts of problems. Um, this, again, you can't prove that this won't ever happen, but you can have a high probability of detecting it when it does. That's one way of, of checking on things. Um, there's another tool that is uh, more aggressive. Uh, Paul Heiser gave a talk on this at Plumbers a year or two ago. It uh, takes a look at the compiled language and, and uh, works out where the dependencies are expected and then verifies that they're actually there in the output. So something like that might be a longer term approach. Okay, so where are we on all this? Um, we did a bunch of stuff, uh, uh, overall direction in 2021 and so on. We had an informal Filtering in 2023, late and formal models uh, were put up in early this year, and we this week handled the store release before they're actually implemented. Seventh period is possible. We just we, we don't want to be behind or anything. But they'll be holding people up, right? And uh, and uh, we have some verification against LK and MM. Uh, I have more work to do there to get the state of control dependencies in, and I'll do that. Um, it might be a full barrier instruction at some point, but you know uh, we make an atomic operation that's more or less a no-op uh, just for its order in and that works. So, um, and in fact, if you look at x86, if you look at SMPMD, the SMPMD macro on x86, it, it does exactly the same thing. It generates an atomic instruction that uh, is a no-op operating on a stack location, but right now it works the same as x86, so maybe it's not so bad. But maybe we want to construct it for other reasons, like not chewing up registers. Um, and then uh, also, uh, well, we mentioned already this, uh, this start of a possible BPFM memory, BPF memory model comparison against the hardware models to make sure that we're not leaving somebody out. So with that, we now have prototype loaded fire store release. Obviously, we, we may have to adjust that if we get wrong on the instruction format or the semantics. And we have some automated checking. Uh, here's places to get more stuff, um, and uh, this up here is the URL that includes current days changes, recent changes to include the final release and things like that. So this is the work we already got upstream in the Herd 7 tool. This 
Bank Tech Award, which is not a formal release, but what are kind of tools that include Bank Tech. And uh, if you want to know about more about uh, formal verification and memory models, we've, uh, I've, I happen to have written this book that talks about it. So we got a few minutes left. Questions, discussions, thoughts, bananas, rutabagas, <laughs> or banana cat spot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Model that you're building right in the previous slide is in the standardization directory, but it also go into the OA standardization that's happening. That's an excellent question. We were thinking it definitely would sometime back. It would because it would become standardized, but um, we're not sure at this point. Um, I'm happy to do it or not. As a, a, right now, I'm under the I'm a, the organization has a lot of experience with standards body, and so. Unless it's definitely needed, I'm going to wait until it is definitely needed. Okay. Other questions? Thank you there. So I was wondering, like, uh, since this uh, method is with LPNN, and uh, there might be some differences between LPNN and what user-based applications use, like the C++ memory model, how would that play out when both from the state and the business side. So um, we have exactly the same situation with Linux kernel C source code, right? Mm -hmm. So the same way. If you are writing concurrent code that depends, that's trying to use RCU, I, I don't know we have facility for that yet in BPF, with, in uh, any of the BPF languages feeding into the thing. But if we did, if you were using RCU in there, and if you're using something like RCU to reference in that first one, it would be subject to the same rules that it uses in Linux kernel log. For example, if you have a pointer, you've got some RCU dereference, you are taking your life into your hands if you compare it to the address of the static. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can't just in binary space if it compares to equals and say, oh, well, I'll just use the static, and then your dependency is gone. Okay? So I would expect the same rules that are used in Linux kernel to apply to source code using those facilities that are generating BPF and such. Uh, yes, uh, because like, uh, the, like one of the examples I had in mind was like, so for example, right now in the set test uh, uh, for like these BPF arenas which are shared memory uh, maps, mm -hmm. uh, there are programs which are dual compiled. So they might be compiled to normal C with source code and the same function might be compiled to the BPF uh, mm -hmm. thing. So it's like uh, when you're writing the same, uh, like basically code, uh, possibly two different memory models end up getting used in the data. And again, the, the same thing would apply, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We got one right here. All right. Uh, I just wanted to bring up and see if I understood that. So when you, if you're writing BPF code, and I can't remember what they're called now, but like the clients, Say the client uh, store release or the client account operations. Mm -hmm. Something that they something that you need to have like to know what OKML okay, and then operation does imply. Or does imply and know that like this C11 atomic operation translates between that OKML okay, operation but not that one. And then oh, well, well, the, in the case of store release and loader prior, that OKML and the C and C++ formula always matches that. Uh -huh. So no problem. And is that also true for like atomic? For um, Of making a match, and there are guys that are make. Uh, we there, we have we the reason part of the reason this came up is there were some bugs where the ordering wasn't present in ARM if I understand correctly if I remember correctly, and so uh, uh, part of the thing if you use something like uh, oh I don't know uh, atomic ink at run a memory run at run okay uh, in say C plus plus right then the compiler to BPF assembly has to generate the proper Assembly instructions. Right now, there's no loader prior to the release, and so the only choice is the no op atomic instruction. Well, actually, we could use the atomic instruction if it's a naked be value return and get SC essentially, which is okay for at run and other stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, you're basically I think if you're sticking if you're sticking to the rules of the language you're using, okay, yeah. then you're golden. Okay, yeah. If you try to use the crazy stuff we use in Linux kernel, then you need to pay attention. So does that help? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Up here? 
was just wondering uh, what kind of uh, use cases you're looking to unblock with uh, the introduction of uh, uh, the load of Firestore release, uh, apart from being able to write a ring buffer using BPF Arena. <laughs> Better performance. I mean, there's nothing you can do with, with Firestore release that you can't do with a uh, no autonomous operation fault by itself. Or an exchange node, or a value returning exchange to do a slow for you and get you the results. And on the other side, you know, for the fault by Atomic. But those late registers and the happier late than they need to be on the front end, actually. And so introducing uh, with the fire store release allows more maintenance total to be generated on a great number of platforms. Thank you. SMT uh, laws that were actually ended in BPL yeah. model 64. So it's like the reason to make it weaker is yeah. friends. But then um, we would need to somehow like document that SMT laws that are equivalent style. Not exactly. It's more of uh, these ones. Model 64 style. The, 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 we, we, we made a choice that makes sense to us. There's going to be a choice that's official. You guys need to come up with the data, and then we'll follow it. Um, it, it it's a, like, but, but the reason we the reason we recommend using the weaker ones um, is because that's uh, well, because I mean, let's put it this way: ARM initially just wanted to have the SP one, you know, the AI. The, well, not the, and then they and then they realized that everything had performance, so they did the LDP, not the API. Um, so. Uh, that would hint that we might have the same need at some point. Maybe at some point we have to have both. I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense, but maybe like from a different angle. Uh, would it like forget all BPF and all the stuff? Would it make sense for ARM64 to actually change the three people that acquired it to be BPF? Uh, Firestore taught by Hit System once, and he said he doesn't want to be. He said he won't let get to learn any different. This kernel is actually used in this uh, kernel. Okay, it's not a big tool ID that we should take Will's advice. Uh, I would, my bet is that Will figured that since it was already the LDAR, but the LDAR could be weird enough that he didn't want to deal with it. That's my guess. In this case, we're new code, so maybe he doesn't care, but we should actually, we can clearly write it. 